to the perspective of the UNCCD. This is the UNCCD COP15. It is important to us to have uh, Mrs. Camilla Nordhan setting this, the scene by telling us what is needed, what could be done, and what is expected from you know, uh, all stakeholders. Camilla, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luke, and good morning, colleagues. Um, uh, as, as Luke mentioned, I'm here to really give a little bit of an, uh, an overview of, of UNCCD's uh, work uh, and, and how it, the importance of financing uh, for the implementation of the convention. I think I'm also here to ensure gender balance on the panel, um, but I will be very brief. We are a little bit delayed. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a little context of what is at stake in terms of this convention. We know that half of the world's economies is dependent on terrestrial ecosystems being healthy and productive. Yet, 40% of the global population is currently directly impacted by land degradation. The global economy is also set to lose a whopping $23 trillion by 2050 through land degradation, desertification, and droughts. There are some estimates that says that um, achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030 will cost $2.5 trillion per year. This cannot be met by domestic budgets uh, or um, development aid alone. Uh, we also see that the market share is for global sustainable investment has been growing. In fact, from 2016 to 2018, we, we saw an increase of 34%. However, a lot of this investment, especially blended finance, it still focuses on traditional sectors like infrastructure, while the Sustainable Development Goal 15, Life of Land, which is very important to this convention, is one of the least funded. And even though uh, we know that uh, life on land, uh, the goal on life on land delivers the most positive impact on communities and, and their resilience. So one of the reasons for this is that blended finance traditional moves into sectors where the business case is very clear.
Kroll'da.
mechanism then invites purchasers. And so this can be governments, industries, consumers, and those who are able to afford to do so, to sign what we call adaptation benefit purchase agreements or offtake agreements, whereby they agree to pay the project developers uh, an agreed amount of money on the delivery of certified adaptation benefits. So this is a payment for results mechanism. It means the private sector takes on the risk of developing the project. And if they can deliver the certified adaptation benefits, then they get paid. If they don't deliver, then they don't get paid. Uh, and this approach, of course, it puts the risk on the private sector, but this is what the private sector is good at doing. The private sector takes risk, they manage that process, they price it into the uh, into their financial models and so on. So it means that we, we allocate risk to those who are best able to manage it. The uh, purchase agreement, once you can sign a purchase agreement with a credit worthy off taker, such as a fund, then you can use that to raise the funding that you need to implement the project. Now, that's not going to happen overnight. You can't go to a, uh, an agricultural bank or development bank and say, oh, I've got an adaptation benefit purchase agreement, lend me some money. We will have to work on raising awareness about that and the African Development Bank and some of the other financial institutions can put those kinds of instruments in place. But the idea is that the adaptation benefit purchase agreement will then act as collateral for a loan and it will help attract equity, technology and contributions in kind uh, from project developers. And it's also very important to, to recognize these contributions in kind. Typically they are land, labor, biodiversity, indigenous technical knowledge and local governance structures. These are the key ingredients for adaptation projects. And it's important to recognize them because generally they're not recognized. We only talk about finance and our micro, small and medium enterprises and communities and cooperatives, they don't have finance, but they do have these other essential uh, ingredients of an adaptation project. So finally, then uh, the, the purchaser, uh, they receive, uh, this is after the project has been financed and implemented, the purchaser receives a certified adaptation benefit. And what do they do with that? Well, the certified adaptation benefit is a packet of unique information. It confirms the amount of finance the purchaser has put in. It details the amount of additional resources that the project developer has been able to leverage with that finance. So that can be additional finance, but it can be these other things I mentioned, things like land, labor, biodiversity, and so on. We get to report those and declare what they are. And it also contains a narrative, a description of what the adaptation benefit actually is. How many kilometers of coastline have been protected? How how many households have transitioned to climate resilient agriculture? How many hectares of land have been put under uh, farmer managed natural regeneration or avoided deforestation? Uh, and how many uh, hectares have been have, have we seen a reversal of, uh, of desertification? Now, and then finally, if the host country has issued a letter of approval, and this is a final sort of formal step, then the purchaser can report this contribution under our. Article 13 of the Paris Agreement as their contribution towards the stated adaptation needs of, of a developing country. And that really kind of closes the circle. If the host country says, yes, these are our adaptation needs, yes, we have 100,000 farmers that need to be converted uh, or transitioned to climate resilient agriculture, uh, or we have 10 million hectares of land that need to be reforested, then we can report these as uh, contributions towards those needs using the certified adaptation benefits. Um, and my last point at the bottom of the slide there is the ABM is now being piloted uh, and we're ready to start uh, receiving and processing uh, adaptation projects. Next slide, please. Um, and Luke, our, our, our chair today, is one of the co-chairs uh, of, the, uh, of the, the ABM Executive Committee. Now, I won't go through this in detail. It's a more colorful version of the project cycle, uh, but it's unreadable. Uh, Luke's uh, presentation was less readable, uh, less colorful, but more readable. Uh, so uh, I, I will defer to his. But anyway, you can see we have a full project cycle uh, that we can go into in more detail. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, some very brief pilot projects. Uh, we are supporting working with uh, ICRAF uh, here on climate resilient cocoa production in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and we are working on the installation of temporary flood defenses in a housing estate in Lagos in Nigeria using a technology called Slam Dam, uh, which are basically rubber, rubber sausages that you, you put down and fill them up with water to quickly uh, prevent floods uh, from arising. Uh, and uh, we have our first methodology under approval for cold storage of seed potatoes 
potatoes in Kenya. So you can see three very different technologies uh, that all yield different types of adaptation benefits. And that's a good example as to the range of sorts of instruments and technologies technologies that the ABM can accommodate. We also think the ABM is very well suited for particularly things like farmer managed natural regeneration, land management and reversing desertification. And I don't have time to go into it here, but, but happy to talk about it after. We think the ABM is a very interesting contrast to paying for carbon sequestration. We heard from Rishav uh, in the previous presentation about paying for carbon credits. Uh, under the ABM, we pay for adaptation benefits, and it's what we call a non-market mechanism under Article 6.8 <laughs> of the Paris Agreement. And it's very interesting to contrast the two approaches. Uh, there are some, uh, some strong, uh, uh, well, interesting points to make. Uh, let me conclude there. Thank you very much for your attention. You can email us at abmechanism at afdb.org. And we have a website, abmechanism.org, where you can see uh, the results of our executive committee meetings and the guidance documents that we are preparing. Thank you very much. Back to you, Luke. Well, thank you. Thank you, Garrett. I have a burning question before giving the floor to the next uh, presenter. How will uh, a farmer benefit from ABM? Why ABM? Uh, works through private sector uh, as a stakeholder in the, in the landscape management. So, the, I mean, we could see a situation where an individual individual farmer could sign a purchase agreement uh, with an off-taker, for example, for the transition to climate resilient agriculture, but it's more likely to be put in place by uh, for example, a, um, a market supply chain company uh, who's, who wants to be able to secure or ensure that they have a supply of agricultural produce under varying climate conditions. So they are interested in ensuring that farmers transition to climate resilient agriculture, because if they're just buying maize and the rains fail, then they've got nothing to buy. So this would be a situation where uh, a market supply company would create an adaptation benefits project uh, to help farmers transition to climate resilient agriculture and they would find a buyer for the certified adaptation benefits and then they would provide the extension work the training the seed materials uh, and the support to the farmers to help them over a for example a three-year period transition to climate resilient agriculture that's the kind of thing that we would see happening uh, in, in that example thank you Luke. thank you Garad. thank you the next uh Presenter is Dr. Peter Minang. Uh, Dr. Peter Minang is the director for uh, Africa of ECRAFT. He's also the global coordinator of ASB partnership for tropical forest margin. And here from him, we will hear about uh, good practices. Here it is written best practices. So it is quite ambition. So let's hear about the best practices. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much. Thanks, Luke, um, and, and thanks, uh, uh, Philip and, and Camilla and, and uh, uh, Richard for the presentations. I think it makes my job much easier because you've already talked about most of the things. And, and uh, we, we, we are working, as Gareth mentioned, uh, 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 with them on, 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 you know, the pilot for the ABM within Cocoa Systems. What I, the example I'm going to talk about is from Cameroon. Uh, it is really in sync with this philosophy. I thought about it because I think it's more concrete. It's already happened. The only difference with this example is that you don't, we are not yet at the stage of certification, uh, you know, the way the ABM wants to certify. But we've gone through those steps where we use public finance from DFID to sort of move things forward within community forestry. And it says community forestry, but the majority of the activities were in agroforestry systems close to the community forest, where we, in cocoa systems where non-timber forest products that are grown in cocoa systems were actually you know, part of the main enterprises and the businesses, and, and that were financed with technical support. Uh, it was purely a performance-based finance mechanism where we were using handheld uh, machines to record all the indicators, the sort of indicators that Garrett was talking about of resilience and, and performance of the enterprise. And then we would verify that with Richard's, more, Richard's technology of remote sensing once a year uh, to corroborate the data that we receive. And based on that, it was real-time data based on the performance, we would advance the finance. 
we can talk about the mechanism you know uh, later on it's it's more or less why we were working with uh, afdb on, on this because it really fits with the philosophy that we're working on so I'll, without much ado i'll let you have a look at the video now but i think that experiment that we did in cameroon in 34 enterprises was a really huge success uh, with the government uh, in, in, in 34 community forests. So please have a look at the video. Winds are the breathtaking landscapes of Cameroon, covered by blankets of lush green vegetation, and with it comes a joy and hope for the communities living here. All of it is made possible by the Community Forest Enterprises, CFEs. They are the ones responsible for the sustainable management of various community forests here in Cameroon. But they have not always been dysfunctional. Cameroon had almost 400 community forests occupying 200 hectares of forest. of Cameroon, covered by blankets of lush green vegetation, and with it comes the joy and hope that the community is losing. All of it is made possible by the community forest and forest systems are responsible for sustainable management of various community forests here in Cameroon. As the conditions of the CFEs continued to deteriorate, so did the community forest environment, and consequently, the people who depend on it for income. Something had to be done to prevent the rest from happening. Of the the aspect of adding value to the, to the forest was missing. Community forests have been quite largely abandoned in the past because they are given to communities who do not have the capacity and also the forest themselves are in the pool because they are mostly secondary forest project um, as the conditions of the CFEs continued to deteriorate, so did the community forest environment, and consequently, the people who depend on it for allowing them something they had to be done to prevent the best from happening. We came up with the grand project because we wanted to give community forests a community. So we came in to try provide some public finance, but also it was an attempt globally uh, to help communities also practically benefit from, from funding. The Dryad project um, actually taking community forests as a tool for sustainable forest management by devolving responsibility to communities and allowing them to generate economic growth actually fits very well into that mandate. And that has that the system. The method de culture, la manière de vivre avec les autres, nous parvenons aussi maintenant à nous mettre ensemble. So we designed a system to monitor all of this in the materials, and this was the unique thing about. Because we built in 100 devices 
the software and agreed on how they would collect data on these indicators and logging into the system. And that, that data that they put into the system in the rural areas would automatically feed into our servers via the local telephone network. So once they put in the data, we are able to see return. I think it was an efficient and cost uh, friendly strategy because it permits us to simultaneously review the performance of 34 community forests at the same time. So, Zayat really pulled these new lessons, new ideas into scientific uh, materials that we put together as a specialist with a technical approach that were what we created with the Cambia Children now the over 85,000 hectares of forested land of Hanuman are under the best care from 29 fully functional and sustainable dryad funded CFAs with 487 new jobs created, where women occupy 225 of those job slots. Even better, the dryad funded CFEs have increased the number of enterprises that help bring in 50% more income. Dryad is just what the doctor wanted for CFEs in Cameroon. We have to develop it. Sarah, you to be a little bit of 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 a même les petits achats, les habits, les chaussures, les machins, le village bouge quand il y a des gens. Les gens ont beaucoup changé la vie des femmes dans ce village. The initiative has created a very good feeling of ownership. This is our enterprise. We have to sustain it. We have to develop it. And it should be bigger and bigger and bigger. Prosperous and prosperous and prosperous. Community forests can actually uh, provide benefits to the communities. While well, also congratulations. Um, this is protecting the forest inspiring. or at I least giving environmental services. So I think uh, it's, uh, you, we are very and proud. And then I open the floor to, to you colleagues uh, uh, of the, the audience. My question is this, why would your solution be an effective incentive for the private sector and what gaps or challenges does it address? Let me start with you, Richard. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Luke, for that question. Um, Please be straightforward. Yeah, as a businessman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so currently, um, what we are seeing with a lot of the private sector investors we are working with, they are seeking longer-term opportunities where they are willing to invest and willing to get sort of results over the next 20 years or 30 years, because some of them have commitments to be carbon neutral by 2030, some 2050, and it's similar with the resilience supply chain. So I think there are there is more and more uh, interest in the investors where they are seeking longer term projects. Uh, and, and they're also uh, seeing that the carbon markets are just exploding. It's uh, in the last one year, uh, you know, they have the prices in the carbon market have gone three folds with some of the buyers that we are working with. And for them, if they get a discount, you know, the carbon credits in return of investing upfront, that's a pretty decent deal. <clears throat> and what are the gaps or challenges? Yeah, the challenge is supply. There is not enough, enough projects right now which, which at scale. And, and I think um, the monitoring technology that we work with, the satellite monitoring technology, that's also going to reduce the cost of monitoring because, as I said in my presentation, currently with, the, with just the physical ground truthing and conventional methodologies, it has been very expensive to create and issue a carbon credit project. And with using remote sensing and you know today's technology of uh, using apps, we can reduce that cost to a fraction and therefore we can reduce the scale of projects. So instead of doing 1500 hectare, uh, acre projects, you can do 100 acre projects, one acre projects. Uh, so I think that's, that's um, you know, 
also a uh, big part of the gap that we are seeing and how we're going to address it. Thank you, Richard. Um, over to you, Garrett. Uh, yes, thank you very much. So uh, I think the um, uh, the reasons why the adaptation benefits mechanism is, a, uh, is is going to be a very effective solution is that well there's many reasons but it recognizes different types of private sector actors and we're targeting uh, in our case African private sector actors which are micro small to medium enterprises uh, and these cooperatives and uh, and uh, farmers and communities and so on and um, so it gives an opportunity for them to receive finance to implement adaptation projects and they are the ones who have access to the essential ingredients of an adaptation project they're the ones who have access to the land they manage the biodiversity they have the indigenous technical knowledge, they have the labor availability uh, to do the work and so on. Uh, but at the same time, it enables private sector uh, companies uh, and consumers in developed countries to pay towards or contribute towards the costs of implementing those projects. And actually, that's really only fair that they do so. So at the moment, uh, in developed countries, we pay quite a lot for mitigation. Uh, there's many different instruments for paying for mitigation, but there are very few, if any, instruments uh, contributing towards the costs of adaptation. So uh, the ABM enables uh, the, uh, the private sector in developed countries to contribute towards the costs of adaptation, whilst those projects are actually implemented by the private sector in the uh, in the developed countries, so sorry, developing countries. And it's very interesting, the technologies that Risha have talked about this uh, uh, this uh, remote sensing information and so on, enabling us to come down to small scale. These are totally applicable to the ABM as well, and it's essential that we move forward with smart ways of monitoring and reducing the verification costs. But uh, the, the key difference between the adaptation benefits mechanism and the carbon instruments that Rishav is, is talking about uh, is the, the, the pricing uh, and the incentive structure. Under the ABM, the projects that will be developed are those that have the greatest narrative, the strongest adaptation need. Under a carbon market, they, when the private sector gets engaged in those, inevitably they look for the cheapest units. Uh, and this is what we learned from the clean development mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol, where we saw the, the finance going to different areas and not coming to Africa because Africa was expensive and difficult to do projects. The adaptation benefit mechanism is the other way around because Africa has those compelling adaptation needs. So the two go very well together, a carbon approach and uh, an adaptation approach. Uh, and we think that um, uh, the, uh, you know, the ABM uh, brings many solutions and new innovative solutions that haven't yet uh, been taken forward. So that's why we're so excited about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gareth. And now, uh, Peter, why would a private sector uh, but this an average private sector, uh, you know, stakeholder will be being interested by uh, your initiative. Oh, thanks, Luke. Um, I can challenge everyone in this room. There is enough private sector money to go around. There is not a shortage of private sector money. The biggest problem we have on the continent is the lack of bankable, viable projects. That's the biggest problem. Our solution focuses on the risking and designing business models on land that are viable, de risking them and getting them ready for private sector investments. That's the only way we can scale up you know, uh, 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 investments in land in Africa. That's why we feel that is where we need to put the money to de risk and to build the capacity and improve the governance of viable investment projects. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now over to you, ladies and gentlemen. You have heard about, uh, uh, you know, business ready, the risking ready uh, mechanisms that are available there. Money is not a problem. Wow. So over to you. We can take a uh, few questions. Uh, let me be gender balanced. We start with you, lady. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Salima Mahmoudou and I work with the World Resources Institute. I do have two qu quick questions for Garrett and for um, the gentleman from Earth Bank. I'll start with you for Earth Bank. I did appreciate that you've mentioned the aggregation of the different value chains uh, opportunities and connecting them without, uh, with, uh, without takers. I often hear this 
this this argument but could you maybe say are they really off takers out there ready to take the different value chains of african and especially for the sahelian context i often hear that it there is but where are they are they really present and what are the different products that they're willing to take are those products going to get us to those hundred millions of hectares that needs to be restored and to you garrett and to others around innovative finance what I've noticed is that the more innovative and the closer we get to the ground of really finding a solutions to, to, to fund smallholder farmers, the longer the processing time takes. So the idea can be great, the, the vision can be great, but then it takes two years for the money to get there. The lady out there who needs the money, the smallholder would not wait two years for, for, for that financing. Could, so could you speak of the processing time for the ABM or other innovative finance mechanisms? And what are you doing to reduce that time processing to ensure um, that the money gets to the right people on time? Thank you. Well, thank you for those two straightforward questions. So over to you, uh, Richard and Garrett. Richard? Um, yeah, so um, I think there are two different things. One is the carbon and uh, you know the eco credits. Um, side and the other are the commodities and yesterday actually in the sourcing challenge there were a number of interesting examples where you could see that uh, you know commodities like shia and others which are being sourced from the sahel and we we of course are currently working with a number of buyers who are interested in like comes and resins and which are also from the sahelian region um so so there is a growing amount of interest i would say uh, moreover What's happening in the EU because of the SFDR, the Sustainable Finance Directive Regulation, there is more and more regulatory requirement from banks, from financial institutions to report not only on their carbon, but also on biodiversity and several other indicators, you know, water footprint. And because of that, they have to be more and more transparent and more and more clear about what kind of uh, you know, companies are they lending this money to? What is their ecological footprint? What is their sustainability impact? And so uh, we are seeing much more interest and, and not only the cheaper credits, in fact, nature-based solutions currently is seeing much more traction than conventional uh, renewable energy projects in terms of, you know, getting the carbon credits. And in fact, nature-based solutions are even commanding a, a premium in the market right now. So there is definitely much more interest. Uh, so, Selena, let me uh, let me take over on on, the, on your second question, uh, and thank you very much for for raising it. Indeed, uh, we're very concerned about the length of time that it takes uh, to get projects approved. And and as uh, by way of contrast, uh, we we look at the progress with, for example, the Green Climate Fund uh, approved about 200 projects uh, uh, over their 10-year lifetime to date. Uh, the Clean Development Mechanism uh, used a different approach. Uh, and over the 10 years that it was uh, really operational, they built a project pipeline of 12,500 projects. Now, the difference uh, is that the clean development mechanism used this process of outsourcing the due diligence work, whereby they accredited third parties, verification agencies to do the work that otherwise a secretariat does. And this is one of the huge bottlenecks uh, in the approval of, uh, of finance. And we think that uh, this is one of the key lessons that we've learned learned from the CDM and we've copied it in the ABM approach to enable uh, the, uh, the, the number of projects to vastly increase. So we want to see large numbers of small scale projects uh, because most adaptation projects are small scale. Uh, and then uh, there's also a very important uh, difference then between the ABM and, and the carbon markets. The carbon markets are creating instruments for compliance uh, and there are important issues around compliance, legal issues uh, and strict liability issues uh, that mean that the verification process and the certification process around carbon is very strict and necessarily so. But but for adaptation, uh, we're using the information to make a voluntary report under the transparency framework of the Paris Agreement. And therefore, the level of materiality, the level of liability is substantially reduced. And we think that uh, this means that the, the, uh, uh, the approval process for projects can be much quicker. And finally, uh, again, because it's a non-market instrument, the way it's structured is that the costs 
of project preparation, validation, verification are all factored and built into the costs of the certified adaptation benefits. So the purchaser can say how much effort they want to invest in the monitoring and verification. If they want every house to be visited and proof that every household is adopted, climate resilient agriculture, then they can do that, but it will cost more. If they're happy to have a satellite image with geotagged photographs uh, and uh, you know, a high level verification process, then it will cost less and it will be easier and quicker. As long as these things are, are credible and approved by the methodology panel, then we can have flexibility about the level of effort that's required and that will impact upon the time scale. So we, we are very much aware of the, the, uh, the challenges uh, of, uh, of getting projects approved and, and getting money moving and we think that some of the solutions uh, and the lessons that we've learned from the clean development mechanism help us address that in the ABM. Thanks. Back to you, Luke. Thank you, Gareth. I will take two more questions, one on this side and another one on this side. So, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luke. Uh, I, I'm Tanvir Arif, coming from an NGO scope from Pakistan, and I really appreciate uh, these presentations and this gives us a hope that uh, finally there is some mechanism which is going to support UNCCD initiatives and ideas to be implemented at ground level. So we have been working in uh, district Tharparkar, which is a dry land district in, in the southern Pakistan southern uh, east of Pakistan, and uh, we started similar kind of uh, initiatives like developing green spots. We call them the agro-pastoral farms. So we involved uh, World Food Program who were giving uh, food stamps to community in drought-prone areas, droughted areas, but we convinced them that we should use these food stamps initiatives as a green initiative. So and, we were agreed and, and we And developed. your question is? My question is that uh, uh, at the community level, we can only work with the small projects. And there is an issue of you know, technical capacity of developing bankable projects. So how we are going to deal with this issue? Uh, this is my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, how are we going to capacitate you know, uh, community level uh, initiative to be come up with bankable uh, initiative and project. Uh, on this side, yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. But I, I'm more comfortable in French, so. Please go ahead in French. Merci beaucoup, je suis Abdouaziz Diegu. Donc, je suis de la Banque Agricole du Sénégal. Donc, la principale banque qui finance, en tout cas, des projets d'adaptation au changement climatique sur le secteur agricole. Je suis parfaitement d'accord avec le monsieur d'à côté, c'est que le défi majeur pour nous, en tout cas au niveau Afrique, surtout pour les banques commerciales, c'est vraiment de disposer d'un port, bon portefeuille de projet. Malheureusement, euh, nous n'avons pas les capacités nécessaires. Et Gareth l'a dit, les procédures également avec le fonds vert et beaucoup de fonds, c'est des procédures qui sont longues. Et l'autre problème majeur aussi, c'est la barrière linguistique, c'est l'anglais. Donc, il nous faut vraiment maintenant, comment à travers, en tout cas, les différentes banques comme la BAT, est-ce que vous prévoyez, en tout cas, dans vos stratégies, de vraiment assurer par rapport, en tout cas, à la barrière linguistique, le renforcement de capacité, comment aujourd'hui les banques commerciales privées doivent disposer de facilités auprès donc, de ces différents mécanismes-là pour bâtir un portefeuille de projets avec les secteurs privés Merci. Merci beaucoup, Président. Merci. Euh, le débat ici est très intéressant dans la mesure où euh, on parle au secteur privé. Le secteur privé se trouve devant vous, donc euh, la question que je poserai, comment vous pouvez m'aider si euh, euh, les discussions qu'on peut avoir avec vous euh, se passe au niveau d'une tribune où effectivement chacun donne voilà ce que je fais mais je vous demande comment vous pouvez m'aider je dis cela dans la mesure où déjà euh, je crois que la BAD a fait énormément d'efforts parce que nous avons eu nous secteur privé avec la BAD des échanges et ça fait partie d'un programme euh, qui concerne euh, l'appui euh, au système euh, disons euh, à l'ensemble du secteur privé 
et un programme qui, qui va démarrer. Là, on a eu à discuter directement et nous, on a donné nos, nos préoccupations parce que souvent, on se dit il n'y a pas de projet. Effectivement, il n'y a pas de projet, mais généralement, il y a des idées qu'il faut formaliser en projet. Il faut pouvoir les mettre. Mais comment vous pouvez nous aider pour qu'on puisse rentrer dans un dialogue Parce que là, on est éloigné. Hein. Mais pour être beaucoup plus près, il faut absolument que on parle réellement. Voilà. Merci, merci beaucoup. Prêt, on est prêt, mais éloigné. Euh, je veux une exception euh, pour faire le tout gender balance. Mais soyez bref, s'il vous plaît, parce qu'on n'a plus de marge. Euh, D'accord. Moi, je voulais demander au monsieur. Il Ce a monsieur s'appelle Garrett. Oui, monsieur, APA, IBM. Il a parlé d'acheteurs, d'entreprises qui achètent le carbone. C'est avec eux qu'ils travaillent. Est-ce que ça existe en Côte d'Ivoire? Ils ont dit qu'il il a dit ici qu'il qu finance les petits agriculteurs comme nous. Est-ce que ça se fait en Côte d'Ivoire S'il y a eu des projets de préservation de l'environnement qui, euh, qui ont été menés en Afrique, bon, je vais entendre le nom de Côte d'Ivoire. Où est notre place, nous les femmes, les petits agriculteurs Qu'est-ce qu'on qu fait pendant que le carité contribue à la préservation de l'environnement tout ce que vous avez dit là, on est d'accord. Mais nous, notre place là, c'est où Et puis, qu'est-ce que vous allez faire concrètement pour nous Pour qu'il y ait un impact réel sur les femmes du milieu rural dans les villages Merci, madame. Je... <rire> Merci, madame. Vous, êtes, vous avez été entendu. Alors, euh, colleagues, uh, first, making community project bankable. How are you going to do that Who would like to take that one Yes, please. Yeah. yeah, Peter, go ahead. Um, no, <clears throat> thanks. I think, um, I think there are no two ways out of this. We will need to find ways of investing in those processes. They are not cheap, they are not short, but we need to find efficient ways of doing it. Um, we, I think one of the problems that we have is, is that banks, for example, like yours, uh, Monsieur Giroud, don't have the data to show how viable these projects are. Un des objectifs qu'on avait dans notre projet, c'était de créer une base de données qui nous permet d'aller vers les banques. Aujourd'hui, je peux vous dire, toutes les, les 34 entreprises qu'on a créées, qu a, avec lesquelles on a travaillé, il y en a 10 qui sont allées vers les banques avec le projet bancable. Mais en tout, on a commencé au départ avec 100 projets, mais on a vu qu'il y avait seulement 40 projets bancables. Dans le processus, on a fait le due diligence pour éliminer une, une, une trentaine de projets aussi par rapport à la performance institutionnelle au niveau du village. Là, on a dit qu'il fallait les former pour les amener à avoir le niveau qu'il faut. Donc, c'est un investissement qu'il faut. Moi, je pense que ce qui est bien avec ABM, c'est qu'ils reconnaissent qu'il y a ce travail à faire dès le départ et qu'il faut s'y investir. Donc, pour nous, il est question d'identifier les capacités, avoir une discussion avec les banques comme vous, quelles sont les lacunes, qu'est-ce qui ne nous permet pas. Parce que, techniquement parlant, il faut une politique aussi au niveau national. Vous savez, un projet de, de, de reboisement ou bien un projet de culture pérenne comme le cacao ou le café ou l'intégration des espèces euh, dans les, les systèmes arbustes, on ne peut pas avoir de, 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 de la rentabilité à moins de trois ans après plantation. Donc, il faut des modèles agroforestiers qui nous permettent de, que ces gens-là puissent avoir quelque chose au départ avant d'arriver à, à cette période de trois ans. Parce que les banques n'attendent pas trois ans pour financer. Donc, c'est un système complexe. Il faut un dialogue entre privé et les, les, les facilitateurs comme ABM, mais une reconnaissance, c'est comme ce que ABM est en train de faire, que c'est nécessaire de financer ce processus-là. 
il y a beaucoup de risques. Comment gérer ces risques à ce niveau-là Même les risques de gouvernance, mais il faut le reconnaître comme ABM est en train de le faire. Donc, je pense que euh, nous, nous avons cette expérience-là et il faut le mobiliser, il faut l'amener à l'échelle. Oui. Well, merci, Peter. Uh, and, and Gareth, you have heard Peter elaborating on actually uh, even praising ABM for coming forth with a solution. But how do you intend to help the private sector, uh, you know, uh, coming up with uh, ABM suitable project? And you have also heard from Mr. Jelou that even the, you know, the commercial banks are lacking capacity. So how do you uh, intend to bring them in the loop so that they will be therefore uh, intermediaries for ABM? Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, um, and uh, lots of good questions. I think the, um, in order to, 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 to see the, the adaptation benefit mechanism move forward into a sort of a fully operational phase, uh, there are some specific things we need, uh, and uh, in particular in relation to being able to create these bankable projects. The first thing we need is a, 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 a methodology, and, and in the example from Pakistan, uh, you know, this is a climate resilient agriculture methodology for the Shia butter. Uh, it would be a methodology uh, that determines determines uh, how Shia butter production is um, uh, vulnerable to changing climate and what you need to do to ensure that you can continue to produce uh, Shia butter under a changing climate. So these are the sorts of things that we need within a method for, in, in a methodology. Then we need uh, our, ideally we need uh, the developing countries to communicate uh, through either their nationally determined contributions or their adaptation communications or national adaptation plans. We need them to say what their adaptation needs are. So in Pakistan, it could be saying, you know, we have 100,000 farmers who need to transition to climate resilient agriculture. And for the Shia butter, you may say, you know, we need the Shia butter sector uh, to receive support to become resilient to climate change. We need this published and written in the, the, the formal documentation that parties submit so that they then the developed countries can say, okay, I want to support these activities and I'm willing to, to put money towards doing that. And that, that's the final part of the puzzle is developed countries need to realize that it's time they start contributing towards the costs of adaptation and not just mitigation. Uh, so that's, that's a big hurdle. But when you listen to the, the, the politicians, they say, we want to double the amount of finance going towards adaptation. That was a commitment that came out of COP26. They don't know how to do it, but the adaptation benefits mechanism is a tool that they could use to channel funding into adaptation in a transparent and credible manner. So if you have those things, if we can put those things in place, and if we can create uh, funding instruments, we're working on creation, creating the African Adaptation Benefit Fund, uh, that those instruments can then create uh, the, the, the funds uh, that, uh, that would enable us to reach out to the private sector and, uh, and you know, call for your inputs. Let me pause there. Well, thank you. Uh, colleagues, I would have loved to have more time, but we have started late and we have to uh, conclude now. So please join me to congratulate our uh, panelists. And what I, what I will ask you all is to take the message here home and do your share of homeworks. Thank you very much.